Tuesday, it's 4 p.m. Central European Summertime and we are back from the Space Symposium. And today it's a special day. It's Moon Landing Day, if everything goes according to plan. Otherwise, it's something dropped on the moon. However, we are delighted to welcome you to another episode of our Space Cafe 33 Minutes with Dr. Clemens Kaiser today about unlocking the potential of LEO, the data networks in the sky. Thank you all for spending your time with us here today now. As always, we truly appreciate your participation and ongoing feedback. We are committed to learning from your input and continuously improving our webinars to make them more engaging and informative to you. I'm Torsten, the publisher of spacewatch.global and we are a European or a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. And I would like to thank all our private and corporate supporters in 2023 that showed their continuous commitment to keep our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are familiar with our websites, the bi-weekly and the daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast, the Space Cafe radios and the Space Cafe, uh, the Space Economy Insights podcast. We are working on new episodes as we speak and they will be published in the next days. We have a bit of a backlog or as our, yeah, the market kept us busy over the last days and weeks, so stay tuned. But also our fan shop is open for you. It's always open because it's on our website. And if you treat yourself with something nice, become a space watcher today and uh, show us your support. If you have missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the events section. Again, here, a short com uh, comment on that. We have a backlog of about four weeks with the, uh, with the uh, space cafes, but they will be there and then they will be also on YouTube. So my guest today is one of the outstanding visionaries in the European space industry. And I say that with all the respect or as Anne, and we don't release her surname here, called him in our space cafe radio, the Greyback that asked her to join the company. It is a truly honor for me to have him in my Space Cafe live here today, knowing how busy he is. So welcome, Dr. Clemens Kaiser. So, welcome. Clemens, <laughs> are two, the few in our audience that might not know your full bio. Um, I'm not reading them out, so don't worry, uh, just a few highlights. So Clemens brings more than 20 years of experience in the space industry. And then when I read it earlier, I said, hmm, from my point of view, that does not sound that long. <laughs> but however, we figured out that we are the same age. So, but what he did is very impressive and that obviously matters. So between 99 and 2013, he served as the managing director at Kaiser Trader, a system house in Germany specialized in high technology solutions for aerospace and science, where he was responsible for the development of the Kaiser Trader Ariane Spass platform. Then uh, four years later, he was the director of program development at UMEDSAT, where he was involved into the Sentinel-3 program. And without, it goes without any saying, he has an in-depth knowledge of system engineering and program management for the development of complex operational space-based infrastructure. So once more, uh, welcome Clemens to our show. Tell me, we couldn't met at the space symposium, uh, unfortunately, to create our our trailer for the show. So, how was the space symposium for you? Yeah, thanks, Thorsten. First of all, thank you really for your kind introduction, and uh, uh, and I, I know exactly um, who Anne is, and uh, it's a smile on my face, um, and. Uh, uh, thanks for this uh, gray bag thing. Yeah, sometimes I say silver bag, gray bag, it doesn't matter, but it is all about. The point is indeed, um, although I'm uh, in nearly 25 years now in, in business, I never was in Colorado Springs. I never was at the Space Symposium. Uh, because from Europe, yeah, sometimes you say, well, this is a US thing, this is US customers, yeah. Uh, and um, I was the first time there. Uh, it was more a coincident and a very uh, short notice thing. I was deeply impressed, I must say, about the 
uh, about this show huge 14,000 people in this tiny sorry to say village of Colorado Springs it's more or less exploded uh, thanks to this mass of people um, uh, going there and everyone was there so it was not only US it was of course mainly US but I was really happy to see a lot of European companies, German companies, startups from all over Europe, from Asia, uh, the agencies were there, also the agencies from outside the US. Yeah. And uh, this means this was really a get together. It was uh, a huge site where you permanently bumped into people you know. And it was really a nice three days, I would say, uh, um, seeing each other again. And I think this is all about because it's space is networking, to be honest. Yeah, and uh, the network was simply there, and I enjoyed very much uh, this uh, this event. I must say, I, I absolutely can share your observation. Um, I mean, I saw a few militaries that you didn't mention. <laughs> I'm quite sure you saw them as well, um, which is not very common for our shows that we have here in Europe or all over the, the, the world. But yeah. um, no, it was 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 absolutely interesting, and it was also my first experience with the uh, space symposium. And as you said, networking is one key element. I would like to talk with you about networks in in the sky. Haha, <laughs> what a nice transfer! Ah, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, in, in light of the growing competition uh, within the Leo connectivity market, what's different? What's the difference that Rivada's constellation offers? In this yeah, it's. It's, it's really a good question because, I mean, if you work in the space business and there are plenty of opportunities to work in space, and then there is it's also, say, uh, this, I would not say niche, but there's a special topic, which is constellations, especially in the LEO world. And if you spoke about LEO, uh, Leo telecommunication constellations, uh, you put them all more or less, uh, first of all, all in one basket. And then people are permanently asking us, but what is the difference? This is a very fair question. I reply always uh, in the saying, well, not everything which has four wheels is a car. Sometimes it's a truck, sometimes it's a trolley, sometimes it's a bus. And this is a bit like here. You have really to go to deeply into maybe sort of say the technology which is on the satellite itself, because the satellite at the end, the platform is a carrier of something, a payload, and these payloads are the difference. So what we are doing is our payload is equipped with an optical mesh. Uh, we, I'm pretty sure we'll become to that. Means we interlink the satellites, and we simply what we do is we lift the network, which is normally established on ground, into the sky. So we're really using network protocols um, and do not touch the ground. And this is the main difference. Yeah, if you and I'm allowed to say really with Starlink and and one of them, I have really. Um, a high sympathy and, and uh, recognition of what they have done, because we all learned a lot about your constellations, but it's simply a complete different architecture. Yeah? They need uh, uh, terrestrial ground infrastructure to base because it's a band pad system, a so-called last mile system, it's all fair. Uh, and this was, and it's a B2C, I would say, mm -hmm. uh, business model. We have another model, we will also come to that, which is B2B, and we provide simply point to point connectivity without touching the ground. Of differences to, I would say, constellations. We do not claim we will be the only one, but we are very likely the first one of this new technology, and others will uh, maybe follow because the market is huge. Yeah. Okay, so I don't have to ask the why questions. Or my, my only why question is why why are you not connected on a on a satellite link? Because we have some some internet problems um, with you while while speaking. So I um, hope that will be as stable. So yeah, where's where's well, Satcom if when we need it? You know <laughs> exactly. And um, uh, and the, another difference, by the way, is. Um, that um, um, uh, if I would have uh, um, a connectivity with my network, I could even guarantee availability of services. And what we experience here now, although I'm connected with 5G, is that you have a plan which simply says, well, up to, you know, and there is no service level availability, uh, for example, uh, service availability guaranteed. And this is the difference. If you control the complete end-to-end uh, -end, um, uh, system and the own infrastructure, then you can also guarantee uh, customers uh, the availability of services and quality of services, which, for example, OneWeb and Starlink cannot do. But it's also not their aim. Yeah? 
and then you enter into complete new markets yeah, um, to, uh, for example, autonomous container shipping, the finance market, and so on. No, it's interesting. I mean, we both are old enough to have seen the, the rise of the terrestrial network infrastructure from shared Ethernet over ATM, MPLS, and so on and so forth. And I think we see that happen now also in the, uh, in the space industry. Absolutely. Um, you pointed to optical links. Um, what is so special on, on optical links? Why are they haven't been used so far? I mean, optical communication is, is out for the last 20 years. So it's not, not something new. I mean, I know that, or I think around 2000, I was sitting together with TESA and or, or, or talking about, okay, fair enough, bigger terminals <laughs> than, than we see uh, today. But uh, I mean, even for the moon landing, or, um, that was part of my history um, or a few years back, we talked about um, an optical communication from the moon to earth. So it's all it's not that new, but why is that increasing crucial for the satellite data network? And how can a LEO constellation evolve into an comprehensive data network into a mesh mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, uh, first of all, I must really, as a German, to be honest, uh, it's uh, it's really, I'm, I'm really happy uh, to see that we can really say that the two world leaders, yeah, the two world leaders are in Germany, and this technology is really based on, I would say, a thorough research here uh, from uh, in Germany. So we have TESA and Maneric, uh, competitors on the world market, and they were simply first to bring this uh, alive for high throughput connectivity. And this is maybe the point, high throughput connectivity, of course, and the qualification in space, the dynamics we need, by the way, yeah, it's, a, it's a dynamic mesh. Uh, we have to open and close things. We are crossing, so to say, the planes, there is a seam. So there's a certain dynamic needed. So it's not a, a static, so to say, link. And, uh, and the light, and by the way, there are other constellations alive, which are using, or will come, which are using RF as inter-satellite link, yeah. Yeah. also KA band, it's all fine. But this always bears, uh, I would say, the, uh, the risk of either interferences or I would say uh, jamming and good knows what. And light has indeed a quite uh, um, a high level of security and is not really interfering, so to say. And um, we are already uh, with a standard product, so to say, in the range in gigabit per second is already coming. It's all about really the capacity uh, we need as our mesh in the sky and uh, with our satellites with 10 gigabit per second space to ground via the RF link. We have four links, each 10 gigabit per second because we have also through traffic, of course, which will be routed in the mesh. And therefore, we have, I would say, now a perfect fit of the capacity of the links with now the capacity space to ground for, I would say, our first, let's say, first generation of uh, a network in, in the sky. Okay, so you have inter-satellite links, are um, optical in space, RF um, to ground, KAKU, what, whatever it is. Right, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the, the ping times you have to the satellite then? Um, I, I would I would um, an, uh, answer this question if you if you don't mind a bit differently. It's uh, and an, an I would say a feature we can provide is low latency, because uh, even the uh, um, and this is the difference, for example, to RF intersatellite things. Uh, using light in space, so to say, is the fastest way. Yeah, and um, and low latency applications are. Are uh, really of interest, and we um, are about uh, to provide an offering low latencies from any point to any point on Earth below 200 millisecond. This is not possible with a glass fiber on ground. Simply not possible. This is not possible with only RF links, and this is only possible if you really control the complete infrastructure. Yeah, means you don't go to terrestrial infrastructure which you don't control. Yeah, uh, and it's not uh, under under um, in, as part of your infrastructure. And this means um, the 200 millisecond is a kind of a threshold where completely new applications come into mind. 
of course, there is always this nice uh, thing of high speed trading. This is a very, very specific application, but some milliseconds faster, you know, uh, counts already for them. But there are also e ERP systems, for example, we can, you can run in parallel between two completely different sites uh, of an enterprise. And this is all about it's enterprise to enterprise, what we offer enterprise networks, yeah, uh, even a mesh network and, and here load latency offers completely new applications, even to be honest, we don't know yet what this infrastructure can be uh, used for uh, in the future. I have to add, and I use a German word, a Klugscheißer question here. So what is the, what is the difference in speed between an RF link and an, um, an optical link? Isn't it the same? Yeah, yeah, the speed of light may be the same. This is clear. Yes. Of course. Okay. Of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good. But it's, um, yeah, yeah, okay. But, but you know, the combo of latency and security is feed our features, uh, which we have customers who really, uh, for them, as they said, this is uh, even recently is one of your one of your customers you just mentioned. Uh, said this is an eye opener for them because sometimes customers even don't know that this kind of infrastructure has become available in the future, mm -hmm. and then they think about completely new ways of communication techniques, ultra secure, ultra low latency. And, uh, and and this is what we are aiming for, yeah. Great. You spoke about customer. And I mean, with, and we will speak later on on the on the investment you you recently have have done. Um, a network without customer would be a lot of fun. But um, yeah, the business might might be uh, yeah, not that good. Could you provide some insights into Rivada's target customer base? I mean, you alluded to enterprise customers and so on, but more specifically, and how do you deploy the Rivada Leo network? Yeah, a good question. And because uh, what I mentioned already with uh, typical applications, be it an airplane and container ship, um, I would say an enterprise to enterprise network. These are, so to say, applications we can serve, but our, our, our strategy is not to go to each of these individual single customers. We have a wholesaler. So we are selling our capacity, like really bent pipes, so to say, in the sky to uh, wholesalers who then, I would say, have customers um, who, I would say, are interested to expand, so to say, their uh, business and relationship they have with their operators. Uh, this means currently we see mostly operators coming to us, operators of all kinds, huh? terrestrial, space, uh, uh, they are knocking on the door because there is, of course, a kind of a consolidation currently taking place with the overall telecommunication market, the space market is here. And here inside, there's a lot of things have going on between Leo, Mio and Geo. Yeah. And uh, we have seen uh, uh, Utils stepping in, in the one web and there are more and more coming. So uh, SES has the O3B story. It's all fine. And uh, therefore we are of interest, for example, also for others terrestrial as well as uh, space operators to simply enlarge their portfolio with an infrastructure which allows them uh, more applications. We are a true global uh, network. And this is maybe another feature. We are polar and we are covering as one of the very few constellations, if not currently the only one, yeah, uh, we'll cover, so to say, the polar regions. We go exactly there where no fiber is and uh, here we are and some customers are exactly looking for that and you know this is sometimes as i already pre-warned you it's physics <laughs> the geo is also limited in terms of coverage of the poles yeah mio the same so a true uh, global uh, constellation allows you to reach areas uh, where you want maybe sometimes really connect highly valuable things uh, be it Military, be it non-military, yeah, even also on the on the enterprise side, uh, and here we are. And this is our customer base, so to say, uh, enterprise to enterprise via operators, a wholesale approach. Um, uh, fun. Okay. No, high up north sounds sounds good. So high up north and rural Bavaria, I think, can be yes, can be connected. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, 
with Anne, I, I had this wonderful um, Space Cafe radio and we talked about the ITU or situation mm -hmm. and the regulatory and the waiver that was in that uh, when we have recorded it in the process. Can you guide us through the status of the current ITU regulatory process rewarder is true um just to or i mean i leave it to just you to explain exactly. it to our to our, our audience Basically, i i i think not everyone may have not heard this so so the, the 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 basis of this all what we are doing is is a ka band filing via Liechtenstein, by the way principality of Liechtenstein, who is uh, of the year 2014 and 2014 was a time long ago where people could not even pronounce correctly the word connectivity neither in english nor in german and have not really understood what it is yeah really seriously i have even experienced this still three years ago now connectivity everyone knows what it is yeah and it's all about priority and this two uh, german guys who did this filing via Liechtenstein, were 10 days faster than elon musk with his space link file and you see um this were uh, these were some gold rush times especially in the us and uh, but filing early means you have obligations you have simply regulatory milestones to fulfill you have to bring it into use for example after seven years and you have so to say and this is the seven years cadence in 28 yeah the constellation needs to be alive and what happened in 2019 at the wsc the world radio conference is that people said hey we need to get rid of paper filings because this is hundreds of filings and we want to really uh, nail down the ones who take their uh, job seriously who really become alive and they introduced this milestone approach with an exception that they said okay the old ones with high priority they have problems maybe to reach their 10 percent yeah, we have 10%, 50%, 100% milestone. The 10% milestone indeed would be for us this year. Yeah, and this is, I would say, due to being late now, I would say on, on the track, we are absolutely confident to reach the 50% milestone. But we had to demonstrate now for this waiver that we, I would say, meet the 50 milestone and get the 10% milestone waived. And the waiver is now at the ITU. It's a radio regulatory board. They will decide on this in June. Uh, they have already looked into it um, and uh, um, opened it, so to say, for comments for all administrations. There were already some letters uh, with questions, uh, procedural questions, and so on. It's all fine. It's a fully transparent process, by the way. Yeah. And the radio regulatory board uh, will decide um, uh, about our waivers and maybe others. Uh, we don't know yet. Um, and uh, this all in view of the WRC coming this year. So having the waiver in the pocket, we will see now, um, because at the end, uh, if I was I'm not mistaken, this waiving, the possibility to waive the 10% milestone is, um, is uh, applicable for 30, 30 filings, high priority KA1 filings. And we don't know yet how many really applied, or if they come, and we all know, we have already done an um, 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 a request last year to say, hey, we had the pandemic. Hey, we have a problem with Soyuz. Uh, there are simply uh, things 2019 no one has really thought about how difficult it will be to deploy a constellation. And I can tell you, we have not much choices yeah, in terms of, of launchers. We have a chip crisis. We are confident to get it now. Yeah, But maybe others say, what shall we do in this situation? And we simply lost three years. I would not be surprised if someone opens a discussion at WRC, but uh, we have fulfilled the duties. This is important. We have fulfilled all what the regu regulatory uh, regulation 35 requests. We have the contract. We will speak about this in a minute uh, for launcher and the satellites. And this was the obligation. And here we are. And we are already in full swing with our satellite prime to make the satellites uh, alive. So that means that the the ten percent, so the five, uh, the, the fifty six satellites in orbit uh, by September this year will be then waived to the two hundred eighty eight or uh, in the upcoming future. Exactly. So there is no okay. obligation to meet ten percent. The next is then the uh, uh, the obligation, which is a fifty percent milestone in twenty six exactly. Yeah. So and that's just one Starlink launch. Was well, Starship? Uh, sorry, not Starlink. Starship. Starship. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, Starship Lab could could be could be no. To be honest, and I think this is already also a bit. Uh, it's, it's relatively easy to count. We have contracted uh, twelve Falcon nines 
<laughs> because we have 12 planes and in each uh, Falcon 9 we have about 14 ton of launch mass. I think it would be even too much for a Starship, to be honest, 14 times uh, 12. Um, therefore, we did this, but we, are, we have really, thanks to uh, SpaceX, I must say, um, uh, it was, of course, you can imagine a tough negotiation, but at the end, they wanted to be part of it. Yeah. And we found a really good solution. And currently, this is more or less the only provider where we are convinced of. And I'm sorry, we are spending a lot of money of investors that we can really bring alive this constellation in 12 launches every month, so to say, over the course of one year. And we have a very professional partner on the launch service now in, in, in our team. Let's talk about the, the, the launch port now and the, I think you, you guys make made news with one of the biggest ever awarded um, LEO contracts for uh, the sat satellite manufacturing as far as I remember, mm -hmm. including launch services, one to um, Terran Orbital for the satellites, for Tyvek um, and um, SpaceX, as you just mentioned. What factors um, influence your decision and why there are these two companies selected for the collaboration? I think the numbers uh, sound huge, but if you have followed, and this is a bit transparent, uh, the figures of OneWeb, you're always talking about constellations in the order of four, five, six billion uh, euro dollars. Uh, at the end, it doesn't matter, so to say, of the amount of money. Um, and and then, of course, you always know who is coming from these complex infrastructures, and it's an infrastructure project. The majority of the money goes into the space and the launch segment. But do not forget, the brain is in the ground, so to say, and therefore, uh, of course, this uh, get, gets a lot of attention now from us. But it's right, the carrier, the satellite is, is the most expensive part. So we have 300 um, uh, uh, ordered, so 288 plus uh, 12 spares. Uh, we have not just done it by, well, I would say, uh, drinking a beer together or something. It was a one-year process, mm. yeah, more or less. Now it was a bit less. Let's say, let's say nine-month process. Yeah, we started in April last year with an RFI. We really knocked on the door of the big primes. Um, we we uh, elaborated. I would say, is this uh, something? Do they have a solution for us? And not only in terms of does the satellite fit into a launcher? Can you mass produce a satellite? No. Do we also have a payload yeah, available, which is even more of concern, of course, to bring this. And uh, after this first month, we then did a kind of an RFP for a preliminary study phase, a phase mm -hmm. B study. Uh, we sent out worldwide. At the end, three companies decided to join us. These were paid uh, studies, and uh, these companies were then really in a competitive mode uh, up to end of last year. And we got, so to say, the technical solutions and the respective, uh, of course, uh, proposals, financial proposals, managerial proposals. And then we did really a thorough evaluation. And I can tell you, um, also as a European, Yes, at the end, I, I can fully defend and justify this decision because we have really gone through all the points. It's mostly, do we meet the schedule? Do we get? Uh, do we have the performance we need uh, according to the business plan? And is it commercially also on the right side, so to say? Yeah. And we have a ticker box, all three, um, at, at Terran Orbital after really we, we grilled them and all, all the others. Um, it is true that in the past, except Starlink, and as a European, I can say this, all the constellations have been built or are under construction by uh, Thales and Airbus, yeah? Iridium, Global Star, OneWeb, uh, Lightspeed. Yeah? And I see now, and we had really the privilege to look into everyone's really book, and we have seen a lot, and maybe have, we have the best overview now of what is currently available on the market, both in Europe and in the US. And we simply had to admit that something is going on in the US. And this is, I must say, thanks to this SDA, huge SDA contracts, which are placed there, not to, only to the big companies, but also to the new generations. There are plenty of other names floating around. And they took this chance yeah, to make themselves, to prepare themselves for mass production, for thinking about 
okay, I'm not starting with single satellite contracts. I immediately start with sort of the same mass manufacturing with plenty of satellites in a row. What do I need to do? And here comes now a basic difference. This is a revolution which is going on. The transition from really single satellite manufacturing into mass manufacturing is very comparable to the automotive industry happened 100 years ago because you'd completely design your satellite different if you know you build it hundreds of times yeah, and you have a completely different and this is what we saw in these new companies in the US, all of them. And Terran has the most convincing concept, to be honest. Uh, they started from the beginning with a high vertical integration yeah, when they founded uh, themselves. And um, and this, in my, in our opinion, in these times now, it may be not true for for later constellations because we are also in a very short uh, schedule. In these times, it's, in our view, the best approach uh, that they have an in-house supply chain and not an, I would say, external supply chain, mm -hmm. uh, which they have mostly under control. And this allows us to de-risk, so to say, especially the mass manufacturing, because it's mostly the industrialization question instead of a development question, because the hardware is there. We founded them all. It's only the question of how to plug this all together. Yeah. Sorry, it sounds a bit... Yeah, but it's how to plug it together 300 times, bring it to the launch pad and launch 25 of them uh, every month. It's still physics and it's still engineering. So it's still to use your uh, it's true. It's, it's more by chance now that we have an all Californian solution, to be honest. This was not, I mean, yes, with SpaceX, by the way, it's, it's from Vandenberg yeah, and not from uh, Cape Canaveral. So uh, also logistically, it's now um, um, a quite robust solution. Yeah. We can simply ship the satellites by trucks half a day uh, from Irvine to Vandenberg. This all sounds well, but at the end, although we procure the stuff and launch the stuff from the US, we are a European operator. I really want to underline this um, because That's, this is a difference. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you partially read my question about, or you saw my concern as a European to, to say why, why did, did Europe or did European manufacturers ever had a chance? To come yes, of course. Or, they were part or... of the competition. Yeah, yeah, they were part of the competition, and we debriefed them already. Okay. What we saw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we saw and why we decided. So, I think, uh, and to be honest, as a European, it's important. I, 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 to be honest, I have a bit of concern that we are losing, so to say, uh, our our competitiveness uh, in the world market. And the world market is the U.S. market. Uh, we have to speed up. Uh, Iris Square may help or may not. I think this is another 33 minutes to speak about that. Yeah. Um, uh, but do not forget, and this is what I permanently say, I said before, the brain is on ground. The real intelligence to pay the services is the ground segment. The ground segment will come to Germany, the ground segment will come to Bavaria, yeah? and at the end, uh, the services will be offered from there, and the money will be, the revenue will be generated there. Yes, we have expensive vehicles in terms of satellites and launchers, uh, but the main message is, uh, like also other European operators are doing it, they procure from the US the stuff, yeah, but at the end, they are operating here in Europe, yeah, so we are in good company here. So. I mean, you mentioned Liechtenstein before. So, who is a launching state uh, when we um, yeah. talk about, or according to the Outer Space Treaty? Exactly. And then, who will be the supervision according to the Article Six? True. So, so um, um, uh, the, the Outer Space Treaty, Treaty, and and we discussed this already um, uh, here with really some experts. Uh, it's the launching state is first of all always, so to say, uh, the first one, the one who launched the satellite. So it's the US. Okay, uh, so so be it. But there are also other definition of launcher states. For example, uh, the state from which the satellites and the launch service are procured. So Germany, yeah, and uh, we discussed this already in, I would say, in a previous case here uh, with the colleagues here uh, from the DLR. In, according to that definition, it's it's Germany. It means at the end. It's uh, Germany and the US, but these two, so to say, authorities know each other quite well, and we are currently launching a lot of stuff from the US, yeah, due to no reasons. And they, so to say, will liaise and agree, so to say, in terms under which flag it will be registered. 
Um, so it will be definitely a German flag on it, yeah? um, because we are doing the business and the procurement out of Germany. Um, and the intention is to register the satellite under, under a German flag to make it, and then to make even the operations. And this is a kind of an obligation we will we fulfill, because our regulator in Liechtenstein is asking to operate the constellation under European legislation. Yeah, and this means the reason why we will stay, of course, here and not escape to God knows where uh, outside of Europe. Now we take this serious. Um, uh, we will register in, in Germany. We will operate from Germany and uh, fulfill therefore the conditions and will act as a German uh, dash or European uh, operator. Interesting. So um, that means the government is then fully reliable if something goes wrong. As to the well, fact that we don't have an. German space law. Yeah, we don't have a space law. We have, we have, we have Ingo in the room. That's that's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> so. Ingo can maybe spend another 33 minutes on it. It's really worth discussing it. Uh, it has pros and cons to not have a space law. We see really our neighbor countries, Luxembourg, uh, France, UK, who have a space law, which simply gives you, so to say, a kind of uh, uh, a reliable legal background and framework, which you do not have yet. And this is indeed, we are in, not only we, but all, all the other operators are in touch with the government. And uh, the space law takes its time exactly of that, because uh, what does it really mean? Yeah? Because on the one hand, it's, it's, it's responsibility of the state. On the other hand, we are creating workplaces, quite a lot of it here in Germany, we will pay taxes. Yeah? So it's always, uh, yeah. A pros and, and con yeah, to balance and you can imagine there are different ministries involved who have maybe different interests at the end uh, the government uh, and now with the three parties have to come to a sound solution so to say let's see if we, if we see it in this uh, legislative period uh, it mm. would not be the first one <laughs> that it no, no 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 come um we might see a, a touch or a glimpse of a, of a space strategy, but not a space law that was not even in the coalition contract. However, um, I just got a signal from our production team that we are running out of time. My last question to you, um, and we can't finish this conversation without talking about space sustainability in the Leo regime. That's something that is very close to our heart. What is your company's position on that? This is really a very well, very good follow up question now to the previous discussion points, because due to the fact that uh, we are not relying simply on saying, hey, Germany, it's your responsibility now, we take it serious. So we will implement everything which in turn, terms of future uh, and existing technologies is available, we take on board. So uh, means we deorbit actively immediately when the satellite is no longer needed uh, or is malfunctioning in terms of his payload. Um, we have, uh, we will use all technologies for autonomous collision avoidance. Uh, we will, we will be absolutely transparent about our situation or condition of our satellite. Um, means uh, we take it serious, and I want also to really underline this. This is an effort, uh, but we do not leave the space junk simply in the orbit, and uh, especially. I would say on the operational orbit, uh, it's one thing, but even during deorbiting, uh, we need the active deorbiting because this is even a higher risk uh, to collide, I would say, with other objects crossing all the mm -hmm. planes. Um, and we have, even in case of, uh, we have a, male, a completely male function satellite. We will embark a docking port. We are discussing with companies who will, I would say, come now in the future and make business for on-orbit servicing for active deorbiting in case we cannot do it on our own. Simply statistics at the end, if we are at the end of 600 satellites, they is see one or the other satellite who cannot do it on his own. So uh, we fulfill all the duties and this is uh, also a demonstration towards also here uh, internally in the discussion with Germany that we say, don't worry. Yeah? So uh, we need not to find the right balance between sharing responsibilities, yeah? but we fulfill the obligations we think we have to because we are talking about a quite high number of space objects we are putting into the sky. Yeah. Absolutely. And I'm happy that our friends from Astroscale are listening in and <laughs> yeah, can imagine. Of, a, of it. Um, also want to make a shout out here to, to Laura Zielinski, who had yesterday a wonderful uh, webinar on space arbitration or from the Latin America point of view. But if things go wrong, then 
there might be an arbitration case. However, we don't want to talk about that um, <laughs> here, as also our time is up. Thank you very much, Ari Clemens. We Thank have you. a lot of questions here in the um, um, in the Q and A. Um, you talk about the maintenance on decommissioning. I hope, Chris, that that's fine for you as an answer. Um, can you explain the Al Al Alluria? Ah, the Alluria okay. software solutions. Yes. Yeah, well, I cannot, of course, go into details. Yes, nope. this is an element we had in Washington. This deal now uh, um, communicated that we put them about. This is now part of the brain we put on guys. So Alluria, I would explain. I would say, I would say, uh, is a raw resource management tool that we control now, so to say the assets in space in terms of resources, the infrastructure management yeah, uh, from ground to be able to run the services over this network. Uh, they have done it, this already in the past for other similar programs. And uh, we are happy to have them on board because it's rather complex. Yeah? And uh, this is, not, is, so to say, the ground software. Let's put it that way. I think there's a lot to, to further talk. Um... In, in this kind of format to to bring it to our to our audience. So um, one last question here is how many ground stations does Rivada needs to communicate with its satellites? Uh, to be honest, if it's in routine operations, we don't need a ground station because uh, we will use uh, the uh, network protocol of the payloads between the user terminal and the payload. We simply put a user terminal on the roof of our control center and communicate, and we see each of the 400, uh, sorry, 600 satellites uh, in real time, thanks to the optical mesh. This is a big advantage, so to say, thanks to this architecture. Yes, we will have, of course, an S band station uh, for Lee open commissioning. This is a completely different phase. Sure. Um, we will have uh, a network, but, and this is important for routine operations, to be honest, we don't need it. It's just for non nominal, I would say, uh, um, operations. We have some, maybe we have three uh, distributed um, uh, because we are, we are polar, uh, one in the north and two in the south uh, to cover all. Uh, but this is the big difference, and this is really important to understand. We don't need in nominal operations, really, no, not really seriously, a ground station. We do all this via the, so to say, network channels of the payload. Okay, good. <laughs> we have to stop here, otherwise um, yes. my, my production team will just pull the plug and we don't want it. So thank you very much, Clemens, for, for your time. I'm really looking forward to have a um, follow-up conversation on that. There is so much more to explore, I'm quite sure, and we can go into the nitty-gritty details of physics, because that's what we love. With that, Elena, over to you. Are you still with us? Yes, of course. Thank you, Thorsten and Clemens, for uh, this talk. Uh, before we say goodbye, let me remind you of the upcoming events. So on the 27th of April at 8 p.m., join us uh, and uh, Astro Agency uh, for the 63rd Space Bar by Astro Agency. Uh, the day after that, on the 28th of April at 4 p.m., join our very own Space Cafe Sp Scotland by Angela Matisse. Uh, with a panel on energy and fintech in space. On the 4th of May at 4 p.m., join our Space Cafe Israel by Meidat Pariente with Dr. Shimri Maman. And on the 9th of May at 4 p.m., join live our Space Cafe 33 Minutes, live from Berlin's International Academy of Astronautics, of Astronautics Small Site Conference. On the 10th of May, the day after that, at 6.30, PM. We're very excited to announce our Space Cafe Berlin by Andreas Shepers, uh, Andreas Shepers from the Planetarium in Berlin, in person in Torsten's town. So don't miss that for those of you that will be able to attend. On the 23rd and from the 23rd to the 25th of May instead, we're very excited to uh, be covering the Global Space Conference on Climate Change in Oslo. Space sustainability is a topic very dear to our, our heart, as you know, and we are thrilled to be there. On a th uh, and finally, on the last day of May, on the 31st at 4 p.m., join the fourth episode of Space Cafe Black Ops for the mini-series uh, with Namrata Goswami. 
you can find and subscribe to uh, our events on Eventbrite. And as always, we would love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And don't forget to sign up for our dailies and bi-weekly newsletters. And if you want to support the team and more events like this one, go treat yourselves with something special. Become a space watcher today or help us in the supporter program and get a cool mug like uh, Torsten is modeling right now. Thank you, Clemens, for the insightful talk and for being our guest. And thanks again to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week by week again. Thank you, our audience, for joining us. And I hope to see you at the next events. In the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a space watcher. Thank you and bye. Thank you. Great job. Thank you. Wonderful conversation. <laughs>